So you may have noticed I've taken some time off. Well, I may have given the channel a break, but I haven't taken my eye off the ball and maintained a key interest in expanding my collection and experiencing different brands, including large and small sizes, different types and complications of watches. In fact, in this process, I've developed quite an unnatural desire towards certain pieces, as you'll see. And as an enthusiast and would-be collector, you want to take them all home, but for most of us, me included, that's just not possible. So let's touch on three watches that have taken my fancy. Three watches I hope you'll agree are worth a second look, one of which I may pull the trigger on very soon. I'm Andy and welcome to the English Watch. This channel is about me and my watch collecting journey, an amateur enthusiast with an eye for detail, helping like-minded individuals like you start your watch collecting journey. Now if you like this video, why not give it a thumbs up and while you're there, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Subscribing really helps my channel grow and reach the wider audience it so deserves. Please also check out my affiliate sites in the link below where you'll gain access to my Amazon store and find personally hand-picked items that may be of interest, including all the kit I use to make these videos and watch tools I use to care for my treasured pieces. So today I'm wearing the Planet Ocean 43.5mm. Thought I'd try it on the bracelet for a bit, but definitely prefer it on the rubber strap. Love the blue dial though. Before we start, I just want to say thank you to Artem for supplying these two amazing sailcloth style straps. With an Omega style deployment class, both look pretty good on my speedy and worth a look. The car key is new to the lineup and comes in 19, 20, 21 and 22mm widths, so cover most contemporary sizes. I'll leave a link in the description. Now followers of my channel will know I've shown a keen interest in adding the Omega Aquaterra in my collection a watch I keep going back to. In fact, I have changed my view on the Aquaterra quite a lot recently, and having tried on various iterations, sizes and colours, had settled on the blue dial in 38mm. Now I haven't offered my view on the new Summer Blue 75th anniversary models yet, Aquaterra included, and I'm sure I'll get round to giving my spin shortly. If you subscribe and hit the notification bell, you won't miss an episode. So the Aquaterra was to fill the gap of a solid everyday time and date only piece that will fly under the radar and avoid the eye of potential assailants. Now I've procrastinated over pulling the trigger on what I still believe to be a solid everyday watch and an ideal first luxury watch. Now my eye has wandered a bit and I've taken a look at a few diverse models that could fill the breach equally well. Now I may still come back to the Aquaterra and maybe with the new 38mm shiny coloured dials there's room for a slightly smaller 40mm with a nice tapering bracelet and maybe a GMT. Now that's a perfect combination, we all live in hope. So the stipulation for my next purchase is a simple time and date watch, maybe a GMT function for a bit of flair, a good mix of sporty and dressy without going too far one way or the other. A nice pop of colour on the dial with a bit of sparkle off the case just to catch the light. Now I like my watches to be versatile and do like to throw a leather or rubber strap on. But I'm looking for a solid bracelet watch that wears well in its natural state. So the bracelet needs to be good. Now as a self-confessed watch tyre kicker I know there's no such thing as a perfect watch. So size and design, bezel or no bezel, are not absolutes. It's one of those things where you know when you know. So this is just a guide. Price is certainly a consideration, so keeping it under £10,000 is where I want to be, preferably well under. Now let's take a closer look. These are three standout models I've tried on amongst many over the past year. Three watches that sit at extreme ends of price, with one in the middle. All different in design and would actually make a pretty decent three watch collection on their own. Now let me know your thoughts in the comments section or suggest alternatives. Okay, watch number one is the JLC Polaris Green Dial. This watch blew me away. I'll have to describe my journey and how I got to try one on. 
This was an experience that's worth time to recount, as it was a special day and both me and my wife were treated exceptionally by the very knowledgeable and attentive staff at the London Boutique. Yes, this is a boutique only version and sits alongside the blue dial, both with incredible gradient lacquered dials. Now the Polaris range has expanded since the reintroduction in 2018, with its roots going back to the 1968 Memovox. A modern interpretation also available as a boutique only model. Anyway, this watch crept up on me. I remember the launch back in 2022 and cynicism of yet another green watch and paid it little attention as I don't live in London so it was unlikely to see one. However, on a recent trip to the West End to see Back to the Future the musical with my dear wife, I thought she would benefit from a little education and a stroll down Bond Street. So we popped into the JLC boutique as I was wearing my Master Ultra Thin Moon and wanted to check out some strap options. We were greeted and looked after by a really nice chap called Alessio who provided us with a glass of champagne and of course the opportunity to try on a few pieces. Now I asked to see the Memovox. It was the most iconic in the range uh, with a cool alarm complication. And in still at 200 quid under 20 grand, it's not gonna win value watch of the year and at nearly 16 millimeters thick, a little bit too much for me. Now the price is widely out of my league and even with the inclusion of both steel and rubber straps, wouldn't be something I would yearn for. Maybe a vintage model at some point. Now, the rose gold perpetual calendar was stunning and at under 12 millimeters thick, fit beautifully. But at 50,000 pounds, it's not likely to come my way in this lifetime, but stunning nonetheless, as was the steel version, which wore the same and at just under 35,000 pounds, it's still <laughs> way too much for me. So understanding my humble means, Alessio went off and came back with a big smile on his face with the final watch, the Green Dial Polar Estate, a watch that can require a bit of a wait, but not like Rolex, where you can wait for years to eternity. This is a watch you can order with a small deposit, lock in the price and some time later get the watch. Quite simple really. I was drawn immediately to the dial. Before it even hit my wrist there was just something so interesting about the colour tones, the gradient and the faux vintage loom, the little pops of orange. Hard to see in pictures but you could sense the inky depth of the green lacquer by the radius around the date window as it cascades into the aperture. This is where JLC XL, incredible detailing and finish of dials that Rolex can only dream of. Now it may be my age, but there's just something so nostalgic about the tones. Both me and my wife felt it, and it wasn't just that second glass of champagne. Size-wise, it may be a 42mm case, but at 47mm across the lugs, wears nicely on my wrist. It's a little thicker than the perpetual calendars, oddly at just under 14mm, but the domed box section sapphire accounts for a good millimetre or so, so it doesn't feel heavy on the wrist. Now Alessio also fitted it with a steel bracelet from the perpetual calendar just to show how extra amazing it looks. Now this is an accessory I'd be looking as part of the deal and with JLC fitting all new watches with quick release hardware a really versatile option. Now you can probably tell by all my gushing over this watch I was quite taken by it and I could have walked out of the store with it there and then but despite the champagne Marty and Doc Brown were beckoning so we had to leave. Now this watch is more than I want to pay for any new everyday wearer, but I just had to express my experience and why this one stands at the top of my list. I don't expect all of you to agree as the colour, style and size is all subjective, but I love it and the musical was brilliant as well. Okay, watch number two, the Omega Globemaster. A watch I haven't paid much attention to really, mainly because it hasn't been available in any of my local ADs in the past. So at 39mm in diameter and under 47mm lug to lug and 30mm thick, this £7,000 watch was certainly worth comparing to the Aquaterra as a potential midpoint on size. The Globemaster released in 2015 was the first to take the coaxial master chronometer and the 8900 movement. A step up from the 8500 adding meta certification to the already high-tech anti-magnetic if a little thick movement. A real celebration of the 1952 original known for its pie pan dial and high precision. This is commemorated on the case back with eight stars representing the eight precision records achieved at the Geneva Observatory back in the mid 20th century. And looking at the Globemaster online it's difficult to pick out the USP for this watch other than the historical reference. 
And for some reason, Omega doesn't use many photographs in its marketing, relying more on computer-generated renders. Not great for assessing a watch on the wrist or seeing how light plays with the dial. And in the Globemasters case, the dial looks flat, the hard tungsten carbide bezel looks dull. And I was a little surprised when my local Omega boutique called me to say they had one in. I'd forgotten I'd inquired, and glad I did. This watch is stunning. You know, the blue dial is a metallic sunray effect that glistens in the lights, along with a subtly knurled bezel. And this plays nicely against the more industrial looking brushed case and bracelet. Now side by side with the 38mm Aquaterra, the Globemaster looks better proportioned with the Aquaterra looking a little stubby with its short legs. Now both watches share stunning blue dials with perfect detailing and rhodium plated indices and hands, and with the date at 6 o'clock balances the dials really nicely. The Globemaster is a very interesting looking watch, not born of the Seamaster or Speedmaster range so it doesn't carry any of the design cues, carving its own path and style. However there are a few things that bother me, not to the point of making it unwearable but certainly could affect the long term sort of comfort and satisfaction. Now this watch has a beautifully designed and robustly engineered bracelet with an Acroterra style butterfly deployant clasp. It feels incredibly stiff and unyielding in the hand due to the extremely tight tolerances between the links which emphasise the industrial design nature. Now this is not shiny and dressy like the thin Aquaterra bracelet with its polished centre links. And that brings me on to one of two things that could affect my enjoyment of this watch. Now the first thing you notice is the weight. At 162 grams with all the links, this Globemaster weighs 30 grams or 20% more than the Aquaterra 38mm. Now this is noticeable and for comparison it's pretty much the same as my Rolex Submariner Date. Now as a watch that I want to wear on a bracelet and feel like a comfortable daily wearer, this could tip the balance. Now the second aspect, and one that bothers me more than the weight, is how the bracelet conforms across my flat wrist. Now despite being under 47mm lug to lug, which for my 6 and 3 quarter inch wrist is about right, it feels much broader due to the 52mm span across the solid end links. And where the Aquaterra bracelet drops straight down, as my Planet Ocean does, the Globemaster bracelet is almost bangle-like and feels a little oversized for me. Again, not necessarily a deal breaker, and I'm sure it feels perfect on a leather strap. But for a watch I want to wear on a bracelet, this one would be an occasional wear only. Now, given the absence of this watch from boutiques and ADs, and given its age in the lineup, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a replacement soon, and I'll take a keen interest in it when it lands. Now, this brings me on to the third and final watch of this trio, the Grand Seiko Blue Scarlet Quartz GMT, or SBGN029. Now, Grand Seiko is one of those brands that I've admired from afar, not really having much experience with the watches other than those collectors bring to Red Bar meetups, as there aren't many dealers around here that stock them. But recently our local goldsmith has introduced the brand and I've started to pay serious attention. With the glacial turnover of the offerings from Amiga in this particular branch, I've spent quality time trying the various models, marvelling at the finish and detailing that is a step above anything else at the equivalent price. Now this is not new news for anyone out there that owns or has followed Grand Seiko's rise to fame and can attest to the attention to detail like the mirror shine of the Zeratsu polishing that takes years to master and the detailing of the dials, hands and indices that under a loop are close to perfect. And having worked for a Japanese company in the past, I'm well aware of their dedication and quest for perfection. But don't get me wrong, I don't love all of them. However. This is a brand that I can get behind and start to build deep appreciation for. Now you may think it odd that given my recent collection habits and the availability of some stunning pieces with the automatic high beat and crazy hybrid spring drive movements that I'm drawn to the quartz model. And I'll be honest with you, it's not the movement that swayed me in this instance, it's the fit and feel on the wrist. And as I mentioned in my opening, you just know when you know. And I knew pretty quickly that this watch fit me perfectly. I was initially put off by the crown and date at 4 o'clock, where the previous generation was more traditional at 3 o'clock, but the longer I had it on the wrist, the more I appreciated the symmetry of the 3, 6, 9 and 12 indices, and the additional polish of the case flanks that were previously brushed. So presented with two colour options, black dial with the white GMT hand and text, and a blue dial with a red GMT and text, 
I think the black is very smart and would be a great, if safe, choice. The Inky Black Sunray Dial is pretty amazing, but I found the white GMT hand a little too similar to the Minute Hand, and at my age, may confuse at a glance. Now the blue dial won't be for everyone, but to me, it starts to tick a few of the boxes. Not only is it a perfectly fitting bracelet watch that feels just right, but it also has those pops of colour from the red GMT hand and that deep blue dial. Now the blue is very subtle and almost black, and gives the dial just enough flair and style without being too sporty. The overall design of both have a whiff of the Rolex Explorer 2, with the fixed brush bezel and lacquered 24 hour markers. But that just adds a little familiarity where some may give it a double take, but in my view looks better than the equivalent spring dry version, with the ceramic bezel which moves too far to the sportier end in my view. Not to mention it's near 15mm thickness. So we've made it this far without really touching on the fact that this is a quartz watch. And for just under £3,000 may sound a lot given this plays in Tudor and Longines territory, you know, who offer mechanical GMTs for similar money. But what we have here is a quartz movement that is hand assembled and adjusted to plus or minus 10 seconds per year, has thermal compensation and is lifetime serviceable. This is a high horology quartz. And given that the price you get all the same finishing and detailing of the more expensive pieces with spring drives and high beats, you start to question the value of those movements above this one. I mean, the spring drive GMT weighs in at £5,750. That's nearly £3,000 for the movement and that ceramic bezel. Now granted we're not talking about modified ETA or Salita movements here, and that you may find in the Tudor or Longines. But given the case and dial finish and that high-end quartz, this is exceptional value and compares well with the titanium Breitling Aerospace at £3,500 with its equally high-end quartz movement, although you don't get the finish on offer from the Grand Seiko. Now, I suspect Grand Seiko are using this piece as a bit of a gateway to the brand, a nice low price point to sort of draw you in and gain appreciation. Well, it certainly worked on me. So, there you have it. Three very different watches that could all find a place in my collection and not compete too heavily with any of the others. Three watches that could stand alone as a perfect three-piece collection. Now the JLC Polaris as an everyday and dive and high-end piece. The Omega Globemaster for the versatility and classy sports stroke dress crossover that looks great on a leather strap or bracelet. And then the ideal daily wearer and travel watch in the Grand Seiko GMT. A watch that will go with anything and always tell the right time. Which one do I pull the trigger on first? Well, you'll just have to watch this space, so don't forget to hit the subscribe and notification bell to ensure you don't miss out. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting and a good episode to get back into the chair for. Now, on your way to closing this session down, don't forget to hit the thumbs up. I really appreciate it and why not subscribe if you haven't done already. Also, check out all the links in the description below where I also invite you to leave any comments and thoughts. But for now, I'm Andy, this has been The English Watch. Take care and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.